The lawsuit over the Broncos' ownership is over, indicating the Bolin families come together and struck a deal. Colorado Republicans' favorite target defiantly returns to his elected duties before an investigation of anonymous allegations against him is wrapped up. You got two more years with me, and then some more afterwards. The lights are back on at the airport, and the finger pointing begins over who or what was to blame for the lights out shutdown. And the next viewer's unconventional question leads us to explore whether wildfire smoke might bring us a hidden benefit, more rain. That's next. Denver Public School Board Director Tay Anderson is coming back to the board before he's cleared of anonymous secondhand allegations of sexual misconduct. Take a step back. It's odd that a school board member would become the lightning rod of Colorado politics. But one of the youngest elected black men in America has a long list of political enemies. Establishment Democrats who see him as a radical, Colorado Republicans who are thirsty to make him the face of the opposition, and then some of Tay Anderson's own progressive allies, the ones who brought forward the anonymous allegations against him. Within the hour, Anderson said he is returning to his duties, and he added his school board colleagues to the list of those who, says, who he says needs to make amends. We're going to have to do some restorative justice before we go back and say everything's back to normal. The fe when we go back to our communications with our district, they're going to have to issue statements to our all 93,000 families apologizing for their mistake, all 15,000 educators apologizing for their mistake. And then when we meet it for our board retreat in August, I don't expect to talk about how we recover from the COVID pandemic first. I expect to, to talk about how we recover from what we just went through this summer. At this point, an outside DPS investigation is not complete, and at last check, Denver police have not heard from a single alleged victim. Two of former Broncos owner Pat Boland's children have now dropped their lawsuit over ownership of the team. Court fight was vacated last month, indicated that it was headed this way, and now it's officially over. It suggests that the family has reached a deal internally. Amy Boland Clemmer and Beth Boland Wallace had argued that their father, who had Alzheimer's, did not have the mental capacity to understand his estate plan in 2009. Those documents set up the trust that has controlled the Broncos ever since Pat Boland stepped away from his duties in 2014. The trust has signaled in the past that they want a younger sister, Brittany Boland, to take over the team. Nine wants to know Kevin Vaughn, who has tracked this situation for us, says it's not clear if a settlement has been reached, but that's certainly a possible outcome with the lawsuit being dropped, as is potential sale of the Broncos to new ownership. Power problems caused a ground stop at DIA this afternoon, and the finger pointing over who was to blame for the blackout is on. Outage happened around 2 o'clock, different parts of the airport. It impacted flights for a few hours before power was restored just before 4 o'clock. We asked DIA why an operation of their size would not have backup power for this kind of situation. They told us they have a redundant power feed as well as backup generators for their critical airport systems. They said their generators, their backups worked, and the issue was with a feed from Excel. Excel told us there's no problem with the airport's backups. Could have been a cable at a substation. Perhaps we'll need this to be mediated by the Illuminati in the airport's subterranean layers. Asthma was on the list of risk factors for COVID. You'll remember that. And then doctors came out and they said they felt like asthma kind of disappeared. Patients started feeling better in the middle of the pandemic. Certainly not what they were expecting. Anusha Roy looks at why. Respiratory viruses and people living with asthma are not a great combination. So when COVID came around, doctors were worried and braced for problems. The bottom fell out in a way. We were super busy and then the closure happened and then suddenly we weren't very busy and that lasted for several weeks. It was very odd. That's because the unexpected happened, according to Dr. Mark Anderson, a pediatrician at Denver Health. On the provider side, it felt like asthma did disappear, um, really because it did. It's not just anecdotal. UC Health was involved in a national study. There was about a 40% decrease in their exacerbation rate. That means there was a big drop in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and the need for steroids to help people with asthma breathe easier. We need to think clearly about, um, you know, the role that 
um, viral infections may play. We talked to several doctors who saw a drop in the number of people sick with the cold and the flu, the kinds of things that can trigger asthma. They also said precautions like masks and social distancing helped ward off more viruses than just COVID. Viruses for so many people, they may not have realized it was as big of a trigger as it was. The number of kids that we saw hospitalized for asthma attacks due to viral illnesses really, really dropped. The study was a unique look at how mask wearing and social distancing impacted something other than COVID. Very concerned that we would see a significant increase in asthma exacerbations with the virus. The COVID virus would actually cause flares of asthma. And when we didn't see that, we were surprised. So the whole thing is actually kind of ironic that during a pandemic caused by a respiratory virus that some people's breathing problems actually became better. One thing to consider, though, is we've talked about this before. People didn't want to go to the doctor worried about getting COVID. But this study actually enrolled the last patient right before the pandemic hit, and then they were able to remotely stay in contact with them and then saw that a lot of people were feeling better throughout the pandemic. Kyle, the whole thing has ultimately helped people understand what their triggers are along with allergies and smoke and honestly whatever they're breathing in at home versus work as well if they're still sick. Yeah, when you talk about those those triggers, I think about all the wildfire smoke mm -hmm. in the air through the summer. Last year, we saw that clear into the fall. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we were talking to the doctors, they were saying, yeah, OK, so over the last couple of months into the pandemic, we saw things change. But now, not only with wildfires, but you see the rules loosening up, kids at summer camp and the viruses that doctors, particularly pediatricians, typically see in the fall and the winter, they're now surfacing right now, which is really unusual for them and that means they're starting to see more kids and more people come into their emergency rooms as well. Yeah, this is kind of an aside but it's like a parent of young kids like I know my kids yeah. didn't really get sick with anything during the pandemic and now we expect them to get a lot of stuff. It's like all of our yeah. like illness schedules have kind of gotten scrambled around so it makes sense that yeah. things are going to be new and different. Anusha, thank you. Really interesting stuff. So we have reported on business fines that sometimes are so laughably low they basically just become a cost of doing business. The head of Denver's Department of Public Health and Environment wants the ability to raise fines for public health violations up to $5,000. Marshall Zellinger swapped in for Anusha Roy in like two seconds on the other side of this room. Uh, so get this has got to be a pandemic thing, right, in terms of how businesses behaved. That was the first thought I had, that there must have been so many businesses cited for violating the mask mandate or social distancing requirements and simply paid the fine and then did it again. Public Health Director Bob McDonald said this was a problem long before the pandemic. Denver's Department of Public Health and Environment can issue fines for anything ranging from selling tobacco to minors, not having a dog on a leash, air pollution, restaurant food safety, and previously during COVID, businesses could be fined for not enforcing mask orders or social distancing. The maximum fine in Denver is $999. Public Health Director Bob McDonald wants to make it $5,000. Here's one example for comparison. For air pollution violations, Denver is fairly low in this comparison of cities. The cities to the left of Denver are smaller, but most with bigger fines. The cities to the right of Denver are bigger and most with bigger fines. We saw many businesses very early on in the pandemic, and even again, and some businesses even before the pan pandemic, where they just saw it as the cost of doing business. Instead of sending people to court, we want to issue a higher level fine. I think we're really going to see more compliance with those people that are, you know, those businesses that might be a little bit, a little bit more lucrative and can pay that $9.99. I, I think we're going to see a higher level of compliance without having to issue 333 tickets to court. Those 333 court cases are a reference to a business not paying the fine and instead the city going to court with them over it. McDonald feels a higher fine is more incentive for a business to avoid court and the fine by not getting the violation in the first place. But, but again, we're still thinking that money is going to be the trigger that that's going to encourage compliance. There are multiple examples I'm waiting to get from the city. One of them was an apartment that had multiple $999 violations piled on top of each other, 12 at one time, perhaps because there was an issue with resolving it or perhaps because the apartment said, huh, that's not quite $12,000. We got a lot of units here. We'll cover that. No mm -hmm. problem. Let's just hope that they stop coming back and fighting us, but we'll keep paying it. It's that dance. But if it's 5,000, maybe you have Oh, I don't yeah. think we can take 12 of those. Incentives and disincentives. So much of your work comes down to what, new, what measures you have to push to get people to comply with various things. Marshall, thank you. 
we talk a lot about the possible pathways to get somebody off the streets of Denver and into a, a stable job, safe home, better life. What if that path could start with something as simple as a shower and a clean change of clothes? The ability to then say, walk into a job interview, looking and feeling your best with the basic dignity that comes from being clean. It's why your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week supports the small nonprofit Showers for All. Showers for All takes its shower and laundry trailer that it's built to spots in Denver where people who live on the streets or who say live in the cars don't always have access to a hot shower and a place to clean their clothes. This is simple dignity that is life changing. A guest told them about a series of job interviews that had not panned out one after another. And then after a shower and clean clothes, went for two interviews, got two job offers. Listen, we understand that a problem as complex as homelessness is not going to be solved by a shower. But it might have been the first step toward a better life for that man who walked into the job interview with confidence and dignity and walked out with a job offer. Or the woman who told the folks at Showers for All that being able to take a shower regularly kept her medical conditions from getting worse. And it allowed her to feel like she could walk into a place without people staring at her anymore. So here's what they're doing. Showers for All is a small nonprofit. They're trying to raise $45,000 so that they can build a second shower and laundry trailer, which would allow them to double their work, which is done right now totally by volunteers. I'm willing to chip in for that. If you are to text thanks to 303 871 1491. I'll send you that link to donate. As always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. We know that completely solving homelessness is not within your power or mine, but we can contribute to various solutions. In this case, by giving some of our neighbors the dignity of a shower and a clean change of clothes that allows them quite literally a fresh start. Denver's bag fees have created a new revenue opportunity for businesses, even the ones that pay their taxes in the suburbs and a final trip back to the small county that refused to back down to a big corporation. You know we have a 5,000 person event capacity and you've already sold more tickets than that? What the hell, Jim? The man behind the soundbite of the year tells us what lesson he hopes we all learn from their mess. Next. A simple 10 cent fee has been teaching us about history and geography lately. Denver's new bag fee is highlighting exactly where the city limits lie. There are stores inside Denver's lines, but say with a Littleton address, that are correctly charging the fee and confusing customers in the process. Next viewer Dave alert us to a business in Aurora that's charging the Denver bag fee. It's the Walmart, Hamden and Dayton. It has a Denver mailing address, but it is in fact in the city of Aurora. Inside the store, there's a notice by the registers that said starting July 1, due to the Denver bag ordinance, single-use plastic bags will be available for 10 cents each. Again, this store, not in Denver, not bound by the city ordinance. Walmart has not responded to our questions, including whether they plan to give six cents from each bag to the city of Denver tax coffers, because that's what stores in Denver do. But nothing stopping Walmart or any other company anywhere from charging bags for whatever reason they like. Kind of weird, though, that they point to the Denver rule. Good time to point out that starting in 2023, because of a new state law, stores across Colorado will start charging. Chafing is uncomfortable friction. Chafing is uncomfortable friction between a county's leaders and a concert promoter who ignores public health rules. County leaders up in Chafee County formally dismissed Live Nation's application to hold its Seven Peaks Country Music Festival this summer today. The organizers backed out last week when they couldn't get the county to back down on its 5,000 person capacity limit. Live Nation wanted 20,000 people there and sold more tickets than were allowed, hoping the county would back off its pandemic capacity cap. I hope to hell we made the wrong decision in terms of the health of our county. I hope that our, our situation here improves between now and Labor Day. Unfortunately, at this point, I, I don't, definitely do not see metrics pointing in that direction. County Commissioner Greg Felt, whose mild profanity has seasoned this story to perfection all along, was adamant that it was the concert promoters who did this to themselves by announcing their big country show lineup nationwide and selling all those tickets before they got permission. Fences make good neighbors, but Denver says Boulder is being a bad neighbor by putting up barriers. 
home to Denver's water project outside the city. And we know the wildfire haze from the West Coast is bad for our health here in Colorado. Next, we were wondering whether there could be a hidden benefit. Y'all are coming at us with hard questions, and we want all the smoke. Next. Denver and Boulder, usually allies in imposing various liberal ideas on the rest of Colorado, are now in opposition and a water fight that's going to court. Denver Water is suing Boulder County, accusing them of trying to meddle in a planned expansion of Gross Reservoir southwest of Boulder. Federal regulators gave approval last year for this project. It would raise the dam level by 131 feet. It would triple the size of the reservoir. Denver Water is accusing Boulder County of slow walking the permits trying to derail the project. Denver Waters asking a district court judge to force Boulder County to get on it. Cloudy and cooler today with the arrival of an early morning cool front. It didn't scour out all of the smoke and haze, however. We still remain under an air quality alert for wildfire smoke and ozone. Temperatures were cooler in the 70s to the north, but look at this, almost 100 down around Lamar. This front will dive south. We continue to see tropical moisture coming up from the southwest. Storms are slow movers, tracking from the northwest to the southeast. Get caught underneath one of those tonight. It will be a heavy downpour. Tomorrow, only isolated storms expected in the afternoon. Tonight, cloudy and 57 chance for shower and rumble of thunder tomorrow we have sunshine to start partly cloudy skies by the afternoon and isolated storms heading into the weekend when we have sunshine and highs back in the lower 90s tonight's next question is from chris about a possible silver lining in wildfire smoke hi up here in the mountains in in the winter we uh we add impurities uh to the clouds do some cloud seeding to trap moisture and bring more snow I'm just wondering if the wildfire smoke is doing the same thing and may give us more rain. All right, that's an interesting question. Does wildfire smoke work like winter cloud seeding? It does, in a way. Wildfire smoke does seed raindrops or snow crystals, just like winter cloud seeding projects. But it has the opposite effect. This is actually something that scientists have been researching with wildfires in Indonesia. They've seen changes in the clouds and, and the precipitation, and it can actually feed back into the fire system um, by suppressing um, cloud formation and rain uh, or rainfall and, and then drying things out even further. Hold on for science. Atmospheric scientist Christine Wiedemeyer says that the smoke can end up causing too many of those cloud nuclei. And because of that, the raindrops are too small. They're more susceptible to evap evaporation. Also, the dark smoke clouds can absorb the light. They can warm the air and they can block sunlight at the surface. That cools the air near the ground, creates an inversion, which also limits clouds and rain. So at the end of the day, no, we don't get a rain benefit out of the wildfire smoke. I am no cloudologist, but that's what the cloudologists tell us. If you have a Colorado question for any kind of ologist, we will find said ologist and take them your recorded video or audio message, as long as you email it to next at inews.com. So imagine not being able to shower before you go to work or after work for days on end. I mean, imagine trying to keep that job. So if we'd like to help people on Denver streets find jobs, let's first help them with something as simple as showers and clean laundry. That and your feedback next. Imagine life without showers, you know, to be clean, healthy, hold down a job, be comfortable around others. Our simplest word of thanks yet is for Showers for All, a small nonprofit that has a shower and laundry trailer it takes around Denver for anyone who needs it. Text thanks to 303-871-1491. You can join me and a bunch of other next viewers in helping Showers for All raise $45,000 to build a second trailer and double their impact. And I'll see you next time.